Is this Carrie Hagen, author of We Has Got Em? <laughs> Hello, Brendan. Welcome to the Hashtag CNF Podcast. I'm your host, Brendan O'Mara. This is episode number 11 with my friend and author, Carrie Hagen. She wrote the wonderful book, We Has Got Em, which is a historical recreation of the first ransom kidnapping in the United States. So uh, think Devil in the White City and uh, really any of Eric Larson's work. Um, Carrie has written a great book. It's been out for a few years, and it's out in paperback, Um, so you should definitely go out and get yourself a copy. Um, Beyond that, I'm not going to waste too much time, because I've taken far too much time to get this episode up. I have since taken a full-time job landscaping that um, allows for some steadier income to help fund this habit of writing and podcasting and help contribute a little more to the household budget. You know how that is. So without further ado, let's get right into it with my interview with Carrie Hagen. Thank you. Hey, how's it going? (laughs) Right on time. I know. I'm nothing if not punctual. Are you? I was just remembering our shared love um, for Mad Men. Oh, yes. You know, I'm not caught up. You're not? No. Okay. It's ever, I think I'm three or four episodes behind. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah, so I'm right about the time uh, I started this this job, uh, like, you know, that. I, I have to be in bed at nine. Yeah, like no, I latest. understand. How's it going? Uh, it's grueling, but it's you know yeah. it, it's a good experience. Um, you know, I, I guess I'm learning more and more Spanish, which is good. And um, <laughs> can you can you think while you do it? Can you think about other things? Yeah, that's kind of uh, what, what's yeah. good. Like it's it's in so many ways like purely physical, so I can just. Yeah. Uh, and I'm oftentimes just kind of by myself doing very mundane stuff, whether it's just like weeding, picking up trash, or cutting grass. So I, it lets my and I keep a notebook on me. So if I things come yeah. to mind, I just I'll jot things down for uh, the maybe the the few moments that I actually have some uh, some time to do something creative, which uh, isn't much these days. But um, yeah, I'm still trying yeah. to you know kind of find a groove with it. If that makes any sense. To yeah, it totally does. And, you know, when you first told me you got a job doing that, I thought, you know, it's always been one of those things where I've, you know, you think about career paths to take where you, you know, you're, you're funding what you really want to do. And I've often thought about, you know, something in horticulture, gardening, landscape, you know, et cetera. But then, you know, you have the exhaustion quotient too that you can't you know what I think it was too I think it was watching Office Space mm-hmm. where at the end of the movie he's like working with his hands outside yeah. truly happy and I think I hold that up as a gold <laughs> yeah yeah well I, but, in, in yeah. so many ways too like it's it might not be in the the college career path but Right. Doing something in that in that vein, while that's essentially kind of like what you know we've invested in, invested years and money and in, in, in that education. But at the same yeah. time, if I were teaching and reading a lot of like there's some good stuff, but some bad stuff, and having to grade and like read all this stuff, oh from yeah, from students, like, oh yeah, I don't know, I'd if I'd have the energy to to do my own writing anyway at least you know doing something like this it kind of gets I you out agree. into the world in a different way yeah i totally agree yeah yeah, yeah so. i've definitely got thoughts on that one uh, <laughs> <laughs> um but how's my sound quality is it okay yeah yeah it's good can you hear me okay. just fine i can yeah i had to um my cell phone had kind of died I, I, without my realizing it so i have it plugged in okay i'm kind of at this weird angle i'm comfortable though don't worry about that but i just didn't know if you could hear me okay but uh, you know you did sound like you were at a weird angle there so <laughs> <laughs> oh man but so, thanks for doing this though yeah. no honored to be a part of it sorry it took so long but i like i said i i know how it goes Oh yeah, no, it was it was, it was more on my part. I feel because I maybe maybe Friday nights and like the weekend just feels 
I don't know. It feels crammed with a bunch of stuff. I know. And, like, who wants to I know. sit down and talk yeah. shop for an hour on the phone? But Are it's you a lot of ways. Are for the Triple Crown, by the way, tomorrow? Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm, Are you? Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm not going there, but I'm, I'm for the first, you know, I was at the 08 Belmont Letdown. I was at last year's Belmont Letdown. And uh, this year I'm not going, so he'll probably win. So, uh, <laughs> so we'll see. But I'm covering yeah. it and writing about it for Bleacher Report. So I'll be kind of like live blogging the undercard and then doing some reaction stuff for it. But it should be a oh, it should be a fun good. day of racing. Good, good, good. Yeah, yeah. So, so it being a you know a Friday night and all. What is, what is a typical Friday night like for you guys? <laughs> oh man. Um... You know, I hear what you say about wanting to cram it into the weekend. You know, just the weekend, just, you know, you have so many expectations Mm -hmm. um, and so many plans. And then Friday night comes and you're, you know, you you, you take those two hours you thought you were going to spend that night and you're kind of like, oh, I'll just do two more hours on Saturday. Yeah. And then Saturday comes and uh, (laughs) you're like, ah, I'm just going to do some really good thinking today. Yeah. And then, you know, you catch up on sleep, and then it's Sunday, and you think, oh, my God, the weekend's ruined. Yeah. And then you start planning the next weekend. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so uh, I try on Friday, and I try to make Friday night. I, I've kind of, I was in such a good rhythm um, when we were in our MFA program. And I think, you know, whenever, you know, I kind of go in and out of that rhythm. But I, I do think that overall I try to make Friday night like a non Like, I try not to plan anything, you know, just to have, like, a friends and family and just kind of hang out or, you know, go to happy hour, just have a good weekend night. Um, And then Saturday and Sunday, I try to to sit down and to get some some good thinking done, as I say, which means, you know, I think about Tom, I think about Tom French, you know, I never had him as a mentor at Goucher, but I always benefited so much from what he said, just about the writer's life. And I remember his saying, you know, Thinking and outlining and playing with thoughts, that's part of writing. And um, that's really been hugely important for me to, to think like that because otherwise, you know, it's been, you know, I've had some rough, um, I've had some really rough experiences getting a second project off the ground, and, and mm-hmm. I'm happy to talk about that. And um, Cool. I think that... Well, not that cool it, not that it was a rough experience, but cool that you want to no, talk about I know. <laughs> yeah, no. I know. I think Tom's words have really, you know, I go back I go back to my Goucher notebook. I do. You know, I once, like, I think a summer after I graduated, I kind of consolidated all of the sort of half-filled notebooks that I had from um, my, three, my three residencies there, because I really stretched it out, and... Uh, <laughs> I have this, like, 25-page kind of Goucher notebook, and it goes all the way back to, like, my first semester with Phil Gerard. And, you know, I just kind of have just, like, things that they all said and about just the writer's life. And um, it's I, I don't I – don't, I probably really go through it, like, like, maybe once a year. It's not like I – but I remember things in it, like, from each person that um, – that keep me going when I when I feel um, like I'm not going anywhere. Mm-hmm. You know? um, so you know the only hour the only hour I can, can kind of control in my day is um, and it's gonna you know is you know between five thirty and six thirty in the morning like that hour where I like get up you know I have that hour before I go to work and you know I really. I'm pretty good, when I, again, when I'm in the rhythm, and there are lots of times when I'm not in the rhythm, but I'm pretty good at, at getting that hour in, and I feel like it's like, if I can get that in, then, you know, I, I don't feel, I don't feel, I'm not so hard on myself, whereas if mm-hmm. I don't get that time in, and who knows when I can actually sit down, like, you know, maybe it's like 8 at night, and I'm exhausted, like, at least I feel like I've chipped away at something a little bit, and then, you know, I'm more productive during the weekends. Absolutely. Um, but that's been kind of my go-to, you know, if I can, and I'm, I'm pretty fresh at that time in the morning, you know, it just comes from having a life as a, you know, as a teacher and just always having to get up early, you know, just kind of like getting up a half hour earlier and um, being able to slip into work a little bit late, you know, and... Um, just to just to kind of have that grounding time, um, so that's kind of what 
what I try to do. You know, I try to do an hour in the morning and then, you know, whatever I can get together in an evening except for Friday. Um, mm-hmm. And sometimes it's like a half hour. You know, I heard, I heard an interview with Bruce Springsteen on something. It must have been NPR. And, you know, he was talking about how, and I probably am totally misremembering this, but he, I, I remember the, his last point. And he was just saying how, like, when he was younger, he used to have these, you know, practice sessions. And, and you know, he'd have to put in a certain amount of time. And then, you know, as he got older, sometimes he only has 10, 15 minutes. And he really uses those 10, 15 minutes. And he's, you know, composed things in that amount of time or parts of things. And, and, and I think about that because if I, I, for so many years, I was sort of in this, if I don't get two to three hours a day, it's pointless. Mm-hmm. And that was just so self-defeating. Yeah. Um, and that was really helpful to hear. Like, okay, maybe I have a half hour, so I'm just going to sit my ass down and not get up um, until, you know, I have that time. So until that, you know, that time ends. So, uh, And the thing is, in that you know, 30 minutes, it's kind of like, what's it called, like Parkinson's Law? Like whatever... Whatever task you have will will sort of fit the time allotted for it. So yeah. if, you, if you have three hours, you'll, or if you have a half an hour, you'll probably get almost the same amount of work done in three hours time. You'll it'll just be hyper focused, and you're able to right. just be more efficient. Right. And I think you know, I mean, some, there's some mornings where I'm just so exhausted, I'm just sitting there. But like I said, you know, there's just something psychologically about waking up and 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 having that time where. You know, I'm, like, making coffee, you know, kind of going in and out, but I'm, I'm down there at the table. You know, it's just kind of like a, it's just a helpful draw to come back for that half hour, hour, or whatever, later in the day. And then on the weekends, I don't feel so overwhelmed. And I remember that something Phil Gerard said, you know, I got so much from him um, during those, like, two short weeks of that, that summer session. Um, and I remember his saying, you know, if, if your writing time is you know, two hours in the laundry room of your apartment complex every Tuesday and Thursday, then that's your writing time. Mm-hmm. And and no matter how many other demands you have, if, if that's it, and if you don't make, if you don't make that appointment with yourself every Tuesday and Thursday in the laundromat, then make it up on the weekend. You know, so I, I kind of just have those little formulas in my head that when I'm feeling like, you know, so many things that I don't want to be doing that I, that I have to do, as part of life, you know, or keeping me from it. I just, I kind of remember those little tidbits and, um, I really do draw strength from them. It's real important to be defensive and ritualistic about that time. Cause it's so, it's so easy uh, to, for it to get away from you. If, if you yeah. miss one day, it's, it's easy to say, well, I'll make up that one day on the weekend, but then it like say something, something comes up or in, you're all of a sudden three hours behind and it's Thursday and you're like, Oh, like how the hell am I going to mess this up? Yeah. 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 And you know, it's funny because you mentioned myself, uh, my, my Facebook suicide (laughs) (laughs) and that's come to an end. (laughs) I, uh, you're back from the dead. Yeah. I went off of it. What was that? You're back from the dead. I'm back from the dead on Facebook. You know, I was off for about nine months and I, um, I came back on just because I have a brother in the Navy in Okinawa, and I was just, I wasn't getting any of his posts, and, mm-hmm. you know, just kind of just in general, you know, Goucher, um, you know, so much has been moved to Facebook, just in terms of communication. I was just never getting any of those updates, and, and I was just kind of like, you know what, I can, I mean, and the reason why I went off, you know, two things. One, I was addicted to Facebook Scrabble, not even kidding. Like, I would have four <laughs> or five games going all the time. Um I just addicted, and then, um, uh, and that was, of course, cutting into, you know, writing and procrastinating, and then um, the other was just says, you know, you just, you end up following these trails, you know how it is, and, and then all of a sudden, it's like, you know, 40 minutes later, and you're reading about some crap, you know, and, and so I was just sort of like, you know what, I'm so fed up with, with myself, I'm so undisciplined with this. Yeah. Um, yeah, God. like I'll get caught watching, <laughs> like watching like an alligator attack some guy. <laughs> oh yeah, you know? yeah, and you just follow and, these trails, and it's like a seven-minute-long video, and you're just waiting and waiting because this guy's just poking at the oh, nose yeah. of this alligator, and you're like, oh, I'm waiting to be squeamish here, and all of a sudden, I I just burned, <laughs> I just burned seven yeah. minutes that I'll never get back. 
Yeah, totally. So I, I, I just got really, fun. I shut down all social media. I shut down, well, it's not like I was on that much. I was on LinkedIn and Facebook. So I shut them down, and then um, Lori um, Lichman, I don't know if you ever met her, um, but she's another Goucher grad, and she's here in Philadelphia. And she's um, a science nature writer. She really encouraged me to get back on LinkedIn because she got a um, kind of an offer to write a book about Philadelphia from another Goucher grad. Uh, his first name's Tim. I don't remember his last name. Mm. He found her on LinkedIn. Mm-hmm. And she said, you know, it, you, looking for different ideas, she's like, you know, it really can be. So, I, you know, I like I said, it was about nine months, and then I thought, you know what? What I'm doing to, to come up with another idea, it's, it's not working for me. So why don't I just say, hey, what else is out there? And reconnect with people. Um, so that's, that's that story. So yeah, about three weeks ago, I, um, I shamefully <laughs> reached back in and said, hi. Well, I think <laughs> in, in some ways thing. it's definitely, it, it has its value in that. Like I, yeah. I've never been able to p- totally pull the plug because the, as much as I hate certain aspects of it and I just have just, so much mind-numbing minutia that pops up in my newsfeed. Like the gold nuggets are are that good. Like getting getting uh. stuff from like uh, reading whatever like our mutual friend Brian Mockenhop, whatever he yeah oh uh, yeah from. you know like, yeah those people Just being reminded are why I stay. yeah 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 because they they have a lot to offer and then and then just having. What uh, Austin Cleon, who wrote like "Steal Like an Artist" and "Show Your Work," uh, what he calls yeah. uh, a senius, which is just a bunch of a bunch of people doing sort of similar types of artwork, and the internet is yeah. just a way to connect that web. And I don't know if I come yeah. across some sort of a story that uh, I find interesting or like something that could be expanded upon, but I'm like. I don't know if I'd be good for this. Well, you know, it might be it's right up Carrie's angle, uh, you know, right up her alley. And so maybe I'll send it her way. And if you're not on Facebook, granted we have email and phone numbers, but maybe someone else yeah, has no, Facebook I agree. and they can, they can shove a story your way and it could lead to something or at the very least a, just yeah. a, a paycheck. And there's just somebody for a piece I've, you know, I've been working on um, that I I can't get a hold of and I just thought you know this guy on Facebook and he is so you just kind of send a message and, and hope he'll check the um, the others box of his friend account and um, yeah and that's another thing even when I was off there I there were occasions to go back in and to get this piece or that piece of information I think I needed to shoot Russ Beck a question and yeah I mean I agree with you you know it all comes down to self-discipline <laughs> yeah. you know it's like it's 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 not evil <laughs> yeah, you know it's it's just the self discipline, um, yeah. not letting the distractions kind of be commanding. So um, I find if you go to yeah. it um, with a purpose, it works. Yeah, and you set you you have your checklist like I'm going here to send this person a message done, or if you just want to kind yeah. of play around like. Set the timer on your phone for ten minutes, and then when it's done, it's yeah. like, oh, I yeah. got my fix, and you can just move on and close that tab. Right. And um, there's also a good Chrome extension called Momentum. Uh, I don't know okay. if you use Chrome on your. I do use Chrome, and I don't know about it. Yeah, what it, what it is, it's cause when you open a new tab in Chrome, it has like your frequently visited windows, and it's easy to get distracted and pick pick one of those tabs easily. What the momentum extension does, it pulls up uh, the time of day with a beautiful image of nature somewhere, uh, and it'll ask you a question like, <laughs> "What is your goal today?" And you type huh. in your goal, and below that is an inspirational quote that changes every single day. So every time you open a huh. tab, you get this beautiful image of the day, and right there, <laughs> your task that. <laughs> you should be doing. Oh, so you don't get distracted like with your that. frequently visited site. It's a free extension. It's super easy to install and it's uh yeah, it's pretty cool and you can uh, Oh, that's great to know. Yeah. So I, I know that I would have that uh, that inkling to go to Twitter or Facebook and um 
but that that's yeah. been a big help, and then uh, and it keep it keeps you fo- focused and keeps the momentum going. Hence the name. Oh, nice. Now I'll look into that. Thank you. Yeah. So, how did you come to We Is Got Em? Which I have have to say, like when I read it, I was so like proud to know you <laughs> when I finished reading that book because it was. <laughs> It was so well done. It was. I think I wrote in a review somewhere. I, I hope I did because, uh, that. That it was like definitely. It felt like the book of someone who had done this, had been doing this for years. Like it didn't feel like your first book. It was like that. that uh, well done. It was like right up Eric Larson, Alley, like right in that vein. And uh, I just. I, I really have to commend you on the on the job you did with it. it well, thank you, Brendan. That thank you. I really appreciate that. Um, well, yeah. No, well I, you know, yeah. How'd you come to I, it? Well, I, you know, I've been writing for. I guess I've been writing probably for about like ten years. These these personal essays of um, just about paranoias and obsessions that I I'd had as a child, and and I had this. Huge, 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 huge manuscript of um, what I thought were very funny um, personal essays. And so I get into Goucher, and um, I learn in my first residency that they weren't funny. <laughs> <laughs> people really ripped them apart, and, <laughs> and it was painful because, of course, you know, at that point I'd made... I didn't really. I never really joined a writers group, and the people that read it were people that knew me, and and maybe didn't know how to give me the feedback I needed. Um, and and when I say rip apart, I, I think it felt like that. Mm-hmm. I don't think it was intentionally, you know, people out to get. You know, I think it was just kind of like, yeah, this just this just isn't working. Um, and I think a lot of people enter MFA programs thinking, you know, that they have this project they've been working on a long time and that this is going to be the program that's going to fuel it into the, you know, the New York Times bestseller. Or, you know, maybe the goals aren't that lofty, but I think, you know, you have that hope. Yeah. Um, and so I had Phil and uh, Phil Gerard, who's, again, I, I owe him a lot. Um, and, you know, he, he just gave me some really great advice. And, and you know, basically... I don't remember the exact words, but it boiled down to, you know, you're here to learn craft, so really pay attention to craft here, you know, and think about putting this aside and starting something from scratch. And um, it was so painful. I I literally almost packed up my car and left. Like, I was just so, you know, I thought that this was my calling, and, um, and I... You know, but like I said, I, I also knew that I trusted these people, and I paid them a lot of money. <laughs> yeah. And you know, I I didn't know anything. I didn't know anything. You know, I taught high school English, but I didn't I didn't know anything about you know writing the way that you know that the narrative nonfiction way as we all know it, and that you know the new journalism. And I didn't really know anything about all that. So I just kind of thought, you know, I'm going to prove it. I'm going to prove it to this guy that I can do this. Mm. Um, and, and he, he asked me what else I was interested in. And, you know, I said, you know, I, I live in Philadelphia. I've always wanted to do a historical piece. And he's like, well, there you go. Your first assignment is finding something about Philadelphia. So I, the, the Germantown section of Northwest Philadelphia is where my dad grew up. And I, I knew more about it than any other neighborhood, um, so I, you know, at Goucher, I like, you know, you, you do what you do. You can go online and. Um, you know, you Wikipedia things and you see what trails you can investigate more seriously. And um, I came home and went to the Germantown Historical Society. It's called Historic Germantown now. And, um, you know, it was only open like one Sunday a month. I mean, it was just, <laughs> but I went with this list of topics and I, I connected with a retired uh, history, history teacher um, named Jean Stackhouse. And I kind of told him what I was doing and, you know, that I really was, and I went over the, my topic list with him and he's, he kind of said when I mentioned, you know, this, this first kidnapping and he said, you know, nothing's been done on that in a while, like since the sixties, somebody wrote a book reviewing the case and, um, the investigation in the 20th century. But he's like, you know, I, that might be a good place for you to start. Um, 
everything else is kind of war related, you know, stories about you know, just shorter, shorter works. And, I, and again, I was just looking to do a piece for a film, like just a standalone, you know, a 10 page monthly requirement piece. So mm-hmm. to make a long story short, Phil got excited about the, um, the synopsis I wrote him. I, I went right to the New York Times. Um, the father had written a memoir in 1876, and this New York City-based writer had written um, a review of the memoir and then, like, you know, updates in the case and then, you know, 20th century action and the 60s. So I read those, and I went to the New York Times database, and uh, I just I read every article I could find in the historic, you know, archive there, and... Um, wrote up a synopsis for Phil, and he's like, you know, this really could be your whole manuscript for this program. Um, And then he asked me some really good questions, and I spent that semester, I think I left that semester, I really, I I was reviewing some of these essays that I still had my heart set on, Mm -hmm. and I think that I left that semester with just about 10 pages of this story, and, you know, he really helped me study scene, and setting scene, Mm -hmm. um, and he was very, like, you know, he's just very direct. And, and um, it's kind of like take it or leave it, but this works, this doesn't work, and here's why. And I, I really, really could tell that, you know, he is exactly, his kind of, you know, leadership is exactly what I needed. Um, and I was just, you know, I had really wanted to, before applying to Goucher when I was doing those essays, I kind of wanted to go the Ph.D. route and, um I didn't get into any schools that I, you know, really wanted to go to for it. And, you know, I was just, and I think a large part of it was my writing was just full of, like, and Phil said this, just academic, passive voice jargon that just wasn't, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't what we're, it wasn't the scene setting. It wasn't that active, you know, engagement. Um, yeah. so I just really worked on that, that semester with him without realizing it. Um, and just constantly it was like a personal thing to just prove I could do it, and, and that semester ended well. And then I had Laura Wexler, who really kind of got me to think more about the larger storytelling, because it was very hard to figure out how to tell the story, just in terms of whose perspective to take. Um, for a while I was trying to tell the whole thing from the father's perspective, but what was hard about that was he had written a memoir in 1876, and... Um, then I, you know, my my goal was Phil, and what Phil had suggested too, because it was sort of the elephant in the room was, you know, the kid was never found, so find out what happened to the kid. Mm-hmm. Um, so I spent most of that first year in that second semester with Laura, just really trying to figure out. And there were so many leads, and so many people came forward in the 20th century saying that they were the little Ross boy, um, grown up. That I realized I didn't have the money or the skills to go out there and to travel around and to follow up a lot of these leads. Um, And then I I just, I felt so overwhelmed by that, too, that it it took, like I said, you know, and I really worked hard that semester with her, and, you know, I just, I by that second summer, I just kind of thought, I'm not going to figure out who, you know, where he was. And then I had... um, you know, it's funny because this was my MFA thesis, so that my the thoughts of my MFA mentors really did frame kind of the directions I went in. And then I had, you know, um, the great Dick Todd who, you know, suggested, you know, just taking time to really read and study and to learn a lot about the time period and to think about how the story of what happened to the kid was a story of America at that time. And that was really key advice because although, you know, you kind of think that seems obvious, when you're starting something and you're so overwhelmed with all of the research, um, you know, those obvious things aren't so obvious. So he, uh, he advised me to do that. And then I, so I pretty much just took a year and I took an extension at that point of that semester. And I just really read a lot. And, um, I just studied books. I got through the interlibrary loan, just about reconstruction America and, just continued learning about the um, some of the supporting characters in the case and the subtopics like policing in the 1870s and, um, you know, problems facing industrial cities like Philadelphia then and just really studying it. Uh, and then I think I, you know, the, the nice thing is I had the freedom to do that. I didn't have to worry about page requirements every month. Mm-hmm. I just kind of submitted a bunch of stuff at the end, and it was not good. It really wasn't. It was very, um, 
I, I just, it was just hard. It, it was hard to figure out how to do. Um, mm. But I should say, at this point, I had read Eric Larson's Devil in the White City mm-hmm. three or four times. Mm. Um, wow. And I, I had read it and read it and read it and read it and read it. And, and that, to me, was like um, just as, as good as any teacher that I've ever had. Because um, his end notes, and it's interesting because I saw on Facebook... <laughs> um, he posted that he um, he's just published an essay on his website about how he organizes his research, wow. and I'm really looking forward to reading that because I still I worked really hard on those endnotes, but I had stuff everywhere. I mean, thumbtacked walls for years. Mm-hmm. You know, just it just felt like it was all over. And um, but I read his endnotes were so helpful because. He really takes the time in them to explain how he came to the inferences wow. that he came to make. And that was really hard for me because, you know, I kept saying to Phil, especially when it's drilled in your head for so long, you know, don't, you know, we're so petrified that we're going to make things up. And we know that that's the cardinal sin. And I so didn't want to do that, that it, it, it kept me from making judgments mm-hmm. and, um, you know, that's when Dick said, you know, at some point you have to say, I've spent two years with this material now. I'm pretty close to knowing a lot about it, and I can use my intuitive abilities to say, you know, maybe one plus one equals two here. And, and, and Devil in the White City, which is the first of Larson's books I read, he explains how he came to the inferences that he came to in those end notes. So... Kind of going back and forth between the end notes and the scenes that he, you know, describes more was really helpful. And it, it was, um, you know, it took a, f- a few years to become comfortable doing that. Uh, and then I had Susanna Lassard, who was really hard on me, again, in a good way, really hard on my prose, just in terms of um, I just had so much crammed in mm-hmm. that the, the, kind of there was no lyricism. It didn't really... You know, parts of it that I'd had, you know, the earliest scenes that I'd written, you know, I, you know, were, were better. But um, every residency I had, I, I felt like people were really hard on, on what I had written. And part of that was sensitivity, I know. Mm-hmm. But another part of it was I did have those basic lessons to learn on um, just getting rid of that passive voice and thinking about you know, just drafting. You know, I'm not somebody who can... But I think that some people are. I think that, you know, everybody says this, but I do think that some people have more of a natural gift of writing first drafts that are really fluid, and, and not to say that that's also their last draft, because it's not, but, but I've always felt like I have to work really hard to make things flow. And um, yeah, You're not alone think, there. I think more people... Yeah. Maybe they're, I think more people struggle to get something down because they feel stilted that that first draft has to be something that's at least moderately coherent yeah and, and there is some and it's hard when that. you go to a pro or, or you're in a workshop where you're having to produce and you have to be so vulnerable to let people see yeah stuff that's not that great yeah when you have other people who can you know i mean it's just a Oh yeah, there. And I know. A, you know what? Yeah. There's a competitiveness too, where you like you want to. Yeah. Well, it's that vulnerability. Like you, you want people to believe that everything you put out and share is your, your very best work. But ultimately, like when you're sharing the stuff, I think it's hard to come to understanding that it's a work in progress, and this isn't going to be that final product. But you're still getting judged on something that's incomplete. And so there's, yeah, you can feel kind of wounded that you're getting chopped down like a tree when it's, yeah. when it's not built up yet. It's, you're still fleshing it out and working through and in, in your case, doing all this kind of research. And then as I imagine, cause I, I've done a little bit of it too, that when you're pulling all this stuff in from, newspaper reports everything it, everything feels a little can feel a little bit stilted as you're trying to stitch everything together and yeah. I, I know that was yeah. my experience and, and so like as you're working through that i imagine that you know trying to find that lyricism in the scene and the and the narrative pacing yeah through all this stuff was a, a big challenge especially in the early drafts 
Yeah, and you know, Susanna was helpful in just you know, uh, I by the time I ha- I was with her for the third summer, I had um I had a draft and she took it and read it and took about twenty five pages or so and really went through it copy editing wise and commenting on places where it was wooden or, you know, and just kind of like bracketing it off like wooden and then, you know, maybe um, a different kind of bracket and saying, huh, you know, just, mm-hmm. and then, you know, she's, she said, you know, you really, you, you really have to pay attention now, like stop researching, mm-hmm. stop, just look at what you have and work on this. And that's what I did that semester with her. Um, by then I, I, I could tell when I talked to people about the story, it, it seemed like something that people might be interested in reading about. And I did start thinking, you know, maybe this could be something that was published. And that was a real motivator. Um, that was a real motivator. And I was working a lot. You know, my husband was in grad school, too, at that time. I spent, I mean, I really, I spent most nights just really spending a long time working on it. And just, I was at a point in my career where I just, with teaching, I was just so tired of just some of the personality conflicts and just, you know, just the, the day in, day out drudge of just dealing with people and grading and um, teaching 11th and 12th grade English. I just, I was so desperate to find something else to do. Mm-hmm. That was a real motivating force. Um, and again, just thinking, hey, if I get this done, then I'll get a college position and everything will be better, (laughs) you know, and uh, that was a huge motivator, though, that kind of fairy hope, and, um, and then, you know, when I finished with Susanna, I had, um, I, I started querying agents, and I queried about 21 before, um, somebody bit, and then once I had him, um, you know, and that's a whole nother, you know, he, there were, there were some issues with how to package it because it's not a happy ending. Mm-hmm. I understand that. Um, and, you know, a couple of editors said, you know, we, we, we really like, we like this a lot. Can she make it historical fiction? And I totally understand why they said that. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it was like, no, I can't. Um, and then, and by then, I had I had I learned about Descendants of Charlie, and I felt a responsibility to them too. Mm-hmm. Um, and one thing that was helpful was too um, deciding earlier on, like after that year where I was trying to figure out who did it, just to realize, you know, when Dick said, "How is this the story of America?" Just to realize, okay, I'm just going to focus on the main part of the investigation. I'm going to focus on. You know, eighteen months in eighteen seventy four to eighteen seventy five, and and that's the main thing I'm going to focus on, and that's it. And it's going to be a story of how the invest, why the investigation failed, not what happened to Charlie. And that was really important. Um, and that took a really long time just to get down to that simple structure, mm-hmm. structural kind of guiding idea. But that was really key, um, and it was very freeing. I think, especially to being newer at, you know, um, interviewing people who, you know, I interviewed a lot of people, but I'm interviewing people about dead people, you know, I'm interviewing professors and I'm interviewing historians and, um, you know, I'm, I, I was very much more comfortable doing that than interviewing people now about their lives, Mm -hmm. you know, as I've done with some of the shorter pieces. And, you know, there was a comfort for me in kind of hiding out in history there, um, so, you know, but, but back to, it took another, and, and with the agent, um, so I had the manuscript and then had to craft a proposal. Um, mm-hmm. And I think that the proposal that I came up with um, was better than some of the sample chapters because I was still revising it, you know. Yeah. Um, I think even with Susanna, I only really worked through the first, like, 100 pages that semester, so I still had a lot to do. And um, I was just still revising, and by then, um, once the proposal went out, I think it was like 23 or 24 uh, publishers passed on it um, before Overlook, which is a smaller independent house, Mm -hmm. um, 
bit, and the advance was very small. It was four thousand mm-hmm. um, dollars. But you know, I talked to you know, I know him by then. You know, it's like once you're rejected between you know the agent and the editor forty sometimes, and I know people have gotten rejected a lot more, and I, you know, I'm definitely not. But you know, when you first start out thinking you've got the best thing the freshest thing out there, and then, yeah. you know, the rejection notices come, and some of them are harsh, you know, you just start thinking, okay, you know, I guess I'm going to be teaching for a while, and, and that's what happened, and even after um, that, you know, it was still another, oh, uh, God, I don't know, two years before the book came out, um, and that was, I think I had to add another 100 pages to what, the, the thesis, you know, so it was kind of like it was It was a longer, you know, it, was, it took, I guess, about five years from um, start to finish. And there's somewhere, you know, I don't, yeah, I don't know, but it was, you know, just constantly kind of going through and refining and working on it and, and, and getting harsh feedback from people and, but, but, but constructive. But I, and, and I think another thing was, I think I was just so motivated by trying to do something different and to prove that I could do it. Mm-hmm. But that was a real driving force. I, I also think that, you know, um, even when I realized, you know, you kind of fall in love with the, the search and the hunt. And, you know, even when I realized that it wasn't going to be the life-changing production, <laughs> you know, that, yeah. Yeah. that it's something that I could do and I got value, value and meaning out of doing it. And, um, and it's, it's what I wanted to do. And, and then it, it makes things a little bit better because you found that passion mm-hmm. and it made kind of the teaching and the, you know, the, the, all of those concerns kind of became a little bit of a backseat because I wasn't as worried about them anymore because I'd found this other thing that I really wanted to do, you know? Right. And when you start, yeah, when you, when you find that it's something that you're passionate about, that's when, that's when you can get into, good flow states and then you and also you just don't yeah you don't care about the results so much I, I think everyone everyone harbors that that hope of you know that big life-changing book that allows you to just kind of do it full time or right just uh just to say that you maybe say that you've made it but then again if you ask people yeah. who have publish that big book and they continue to do so you ask them they probably say i don't feel like i've made it yet it's just like uh, you know Tom Brady. Uh, I think when he asked, he was asked a few years ago, you know what, which was the best Super Bowl, or his most his favorite or most memorable, and he, he says the next one, and yeah, and so it's yeah. always that oh, right. it's always yeah. that hunt. And I I know speaking personally with the the fact that you know that I've had a book published, it it doesn't really it feels okay, but it doesn't feel like it doesn't feel great. Like I'm still yeah. in search of the next one and I want that one right, to be right. uh, just charged with energy. I want it to be better. I want to keep improving. It's, yeah. you know, like hark on it. And I'm sure that's kind of how you feel now is you're oh, yeah. to get your second project off the tarmac. Yeah. You know, Richard Russo, um, a fiction writer, I just, I just love his work. He wrote a, um, he wrote a memoir about his mother called Elsewhere, mm-hmm. him and his mother, and in it he talks about how, and he, you know, he's like a Pulitzer Prize winner for Empire Falls, and even then he didn't have, um, if I'm remembering the kind of trajectory he described, even then he still had to figure out ways to make, you know, his financial commitments work. Mm-hmm. You know, like it, it took a really long time and a lot of very successful books for him to get to the place where he could do what he wanted to do. And I I do think that part of sort of settling into it, and I think this is why a lot of people become disenchanted. And I'm very aware of the fact that, um, you know, I had, it was a lot of hard work, but even with those rejections, it was still luck that in the end, Mm -hmm. a place found it and the stars aligned, so to speak. And I'm very aware of that. Um, But I do think that it's kind of like, it takes a little while to realize this, you know, this is something that, you know, you can achieve, but it's not the answer to these other questions. Um, especially I think when you're going 
into a field. Like when I first went to my MFA, I wanted to shift into a career for journalism. And, you know, it's not the best time mm-hmm. to do that. Um, and then you just start, you know, having to kind of reshuffle your priorities. But at any rate, I don't know. That's a very long answer to your question. How did you, how did you get the idea? <laughs> yeah. But it, isn't it amazing that it, it the way you talk about it, it's just it feels like you're still inside the story. Like it hasn't left you and the book came out four years ago. It, yeah, is... I know, it's crazy. Well, one thing that happened was um that's kept me in touch with it was about a year and a half definitely a year and a half ago. A little a little over a year and a half ago. Somebody from that historical society contacted me and said, hey, you know, there were 20 ransom letters that the kidnapper sent. And he said, uh, it was a, an archivist, and he said, um, somebody's come forth with those letters, and they're looking for a buyer. And, and you know, I, there's so many rumors involved in this case, mm-hmm. so many people out to make money off of it, that I just sort of said, oh, okay, you know, and just didn't really take it seriously. And then a couple of months later... Um, I got another call from the same organization. They said, this is, this is, they've taken them to, you know, an auction house in Philadelphia and, and they've been authenticated. You want to see them. And then all of a sudden I was like, what? Mm -hmm. So there's a story that, you know, it's just, just crazy story of this family in Northwest Philadelphia. And they were just, you know, a kind of crazy treasure in the attic. They were going through boxes that, they had inherited and had a reason to go through them and found these letters. And there are some questions of provenance, like how exactly did they get there? They can't be answered. But so, you know, that turned into um, just another part of the story. Like these letters resurfaced and they were authenticated. And, you know, I got to hold them and see this, you know, and and that kind of led to a couple of other pieces that I wrote um, that, you know, it turned into kind of the where the story's going now, and it was back in touch with the family, and, you know, there was a um, an exhibit with it. So that story evolving kind of brought me back into it. But other than that, you know, it is hard because at some point um, you do kind of wonder, you know, wh- when is it going to be time to talk about something else, mm-hmm. you know? And you're still attached to that, and you want to be, and you're grateful for it. But at the same time, it's just kind of like, but but that kind of brought me back into the whole sort of circle um, of of storytelling with that specific story. Um, and that also led to uh, writing a couple of pieces for Smithsonian Online, which I really appreciated the opportunity to do. Um, yeah, that, that, that train robbery wouldn't piece have happened really had this great. story yeah. not happened. Yeah. That that seems like that's right up your alley. That kind of that kind of nonfiction. I would say someone who doesn't come from a reporter's background. That seems like uh, like a really yeah. like a like just a, a a way to a way to t- do nonfiction without the the confrontation that sometimes goes on when you're when you're following people and then you might have to be harsh on people. Like I, I, my sensibility yeah, I, comes, to, yeah. kind of comes to that. Uh, uh, I, 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 I've been able to, yeah. no, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh no, no, you, you go. No, it's, you know, it's one of those things where I'm grateful for it. Um, but you know, it's nothing having the book, it, it, like I said, as grateful as I am, and I realize, you know, the hard work aspect that I definitely feel passionate about, but, but the acknowledgement that, you know, there was a lot of luck there, too. It ha- I'm sure it's made some things easier. It hasn't made getting a second book out there easier. Mm-hmm. It hasn't made it easier to say, hey, I want to write this for you. Let me. Like, yeah. I still have to work really hard on every pitch. Yeah. Um, most of what I send to them, they, I don't even get a response or, or you know, or, and it's just kind of like once in a while, um, <laughs> I'll get a, hey, that's interesting, go ahead and do it. You know, it's just, um, and I think that that's, and, 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 and I, I also think, okay, well, why shouldn't it be that way? You know, you do kind of feel at some point like, when is this rat race going to be over? Mm-hmm. But then you think, okay, well, I just have to get better at pitching. 
I have to get better at going out there and finding, you know, and, and I think that that's part two where I get frustrated sometimes. Um, I'll spend a lot of time looking and pitching and sometimes things work out, sometimes not. And then you're just kind of, it's just, it's very hard, you know, and, right. and you have to have faith in what you're doing and your ability to do it. And you have to have that patience. And as Susanna Lassard said many times, you ha- it has to be about the process, not the product. Because the product, people may not pay any attention to, but it's the process of doing the pitching and finding those angles mm-hmm. that you have to find satisfaction in and unpaid satisfaction. Um, yeah. That's the part of it that I, I do struggle with, you know, on and off where those kind of highs and lows I was talking about earlier. Um, and, but, you know, I keep doing it. I keep going back to it because I do like doing it ultimately. Yeah. Um, and and as long as that's there, you know, you, you know that there are so many stories to be told. And I don't believe when people say, well, everything's been written about. You know, that's a bunch of BS. There's so many stories to tell. It's just, you know, finding them and finding the right place for them and the right person who's going to read the pitch and the right person who's going to have the right place. You know, there's just so much, um, so many cards that have to be in place for any of these things to come out. Mm-hmm. I was very fortunate that these letters were found because that was an in there. And I think that they're more likely to read what I send them now, but it's not at all everything I, I suggest. How surprised were you that there wasn't anything... Uh, this will be, I promise, it'll be the last question about we as God, and we can move on to you. Oh, no, 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 I don't mind, I don't mind. I was, <laughs> I was prepared and happy to do it. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I wonder how, how surprised you were to come to the story, and nobody had really done it in the way that you were able to to, to research it and write it. And so in a lot of ways, you were, the, yeah. you were the, this first person to come to the story from this angle. I wonder what that was like as you were, you know, doing this. I, I imagine it was kind of an exciting, charged feeling to be on the forefront of, of the way you were telling the story. It was. It, it, I felt, um, I think I, I really got my hopes up that it would be something marketable. Um, like Devil in the White. But you know, there are people. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Marketable like that. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, like I said, I I thought that, but, you know, um, people in the industry didn't seem to think it was the kind of sort of re- recovered story that that a lot of people would want to read about. Um, but I, I felt that way. You know, there, there were people. There, was a, there have been a couple of researchers that I've been in touch with um, and it's, it's kind of been some things that I've come against with my second project where you work on something and you don't know what other people are working on and you can pour years into something and then find out somebody else has a contract for that same idea. And, and that happened to a couple of people. Um, they didn't have my angle, but they had, they had really been working on finding out what happened to Charlie and had some theories mm-hmm. and, um, were very, um, it was very disappointing for them when my book came out. And, and we didn't know about each other until about the book coming out, and then they were in touch. And, and I was able to put some of the researchers in touch with each other, which was cool because they can help each other with parts of their stories. Um, but people had been on it in different ways. Um, and, you know, one thing that was really helpful was I knew that there's a great, uh, Charlie's, Charlie's great grand nephew, um, is a state representative around the area in, uh, Chester County, south of Philadelphia. And, and he told me, like, he kind of confirmed that, you know, nobody had contacted him with, with what I was looking for and et cetera. So that, that was helpful too, because I didn't, I wasn't worried that, you know, somebody else might pop out. Um, oh, Carrie. Now, yeah, can I stop yeah. you right there for one second? My yeah, yeah. My phone here, my landline phone here is gonna yeah. die. Can I call you back on my cell phone and we'll just resume this sure. conversation? Yeah, no problem. Cool. No I'm problem. gonna call you okay. right Bye. now. Bye. All okay. Right. All right. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Sorry about okay. that. Yeah, that was. No, 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 no. I, no worries. I totally had 
you know, I, I had two bars on this phone going into the conversation, and I sure as hell thought it would That's last. That's how I was at the beginning of our conversation, yeah. In fact, I can finally unplug mine and um, <laughs> move around, yeah. <laughs> yeah, sorry, sorry about that. I, I just didn't no, want no, to totally fine. cut out in the, in the middle of your story and wonder what was going on. <laughs> But uh, anyway, yeah, please, re- please resume. <laughs> oh, no, 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 that's fine. Um, I was just saying that, you know, a, a big challenge in writing narrative nonfiction um, can be, you know, not knowing if other people are going to come out with something on the same topic before you do. Yeah. Um, and that was something I didn't really worry about with the first one. Um, but it's definitely... Um, it's definitely come to haunt me a little bit in, in getting another project off the ground. Yeah, and I, th- I think one of, what's important to remember is that, like, take Abraham Lincoln. Like, how, how many dozens and dozens of biographies are written on him? And there are different angles, but it's always the sensibility of the writer, too. So, like, yeah. even though some people might be doing what you're planning on doing, it, they're not you. And they won't, right. they're not... Carrie Hagen bringing Carrie Hagen's sensibility to the, and repertorial um, sensibility as well to, to the story. So it's in some ways, what what can kill you is like if someone beats you to the finish line of, in terms yeah. of getting that story out there first, but at the same time, it'll never be yours. So as long as you get somebody right. to back it, and then even then, you might, right. you could back it yourself and try experiment with that angle. I mean, really, what's to lose? Um, right, right, right. But uh, but the, in in speaking of that, what what is it? Um, you know, what are you working on right now? And 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 as you said earlier in the conversation, kind of struggling to get it off the ground. Uh, well, um, I spent a couple of years. Um, one when I was kind of waiting for We Have Got Him to be finished, and then most of the next year working on a project about Houdini, and uh, Overlook was interested, and. Um, I, you know, I just, I have this worry in the back of my mind that it wasn't more than a magazine article. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I just, when I heard, I heard that um, somebody had, had sold a project um, similar to my vision to Crown for a lot of money. Mm-hmm. Um, I heard that and, and Overlook was still interested, but I... I just, I had this concern about the magazine, too, and I just kind of thought, you know, it just, it doesn't feel right. I spent so many months on this, but I just, it doesn't feel right for right now. And I tried to turn it into a magazine pitch, and it just didn't, it didn't gel. And I, for some reason, I felt the freedom to just let it go after all of this time. Um, But then I, I revisited it about, I had, I have a new agent now, and I told her about it, and I had a couple of new thoughts on it, um, but the contract that had gone to Crown had taken a while from kind of the, the giving of the contract to the coming out, and that's coming out this fall. And so, you know, that project kind of had a couple of lives, but I never, I think I was really interested in the theme of spiritualism. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I still think that all that research, I don't think it's gone to waste. I just think I still haven't found the right nugget. But by this time, I've spent so much time on it in two separate segments that I just, I had to let it go, and then I had um, I had another project on Benedict Arnold and his treachery, um, and that is just one of those stories where um, it it was kind of you know how the trajectory of his turning from hero to traitor, and I couldn't quite find the right kind of narrative in this larger interesting story to use as a lens through which to view the larger story with but I had a proposal Mm -hmm. that was good and I was really close to a deal and it fell through not with Overlook with a a bigger house and it it fell through at the last minute and you know it it that was something else that took you know a couple of those years and I you know the the agent that I had really liked it and, and I felt like it was the right pursuit you know he, it happened in Philadelphia mm-hmm. um some of his actions and uh, but anyway to make a long story short it's a very heartbreaking mm-hmm. kind of moment where you know I 
I was in talks, and then all of a sudden um, it went from, well, we're running the numbers, we'll let you know tomorrow, um, to not hearing anything and the whole thing going south. Um, but again, are you there? Yes. Okay. Yep. And um, in hindsight, in hindsight, you know, when I look back on it now, and it was very raw for me um, last summer, and I actually talked to, like, the folks at Goucher there now about it a little bit just to talk about the realities of, you know, we have some very successful people in our program, and, and rightfully so. Um, and, you know, I was able to kind of talk next to them and say, you know, this is another <laughs> way that it can go after <laughs> you have a, a well-reviewed project. But, you know, I, I do really believe in the end, again, after a year of hindsight, that it, it wasn't the right project for me. And I... I don't know why I was so fixated for so long. I think because I was in these really interesting places of history that fascinated me. Mm-hmm. But the narrative line just wasn't there. And I I don't know had that had that deal gone through. I don't know how I would have done it. You know, I'm sure I would have found a way. But, um, but that was hard because it was like two. And then the Houdini, again, I feel like I've had these three projects where I've worked very hard on them and they've gone nowhere. Mm-hmm. Um. And then there was a Smithsonian piece that I'd written online, and um, that's another one that was, it came out this past January. Um, it was about a code breaker, the first female cryptanalyst um, in the American military, and I really thought that I could find something with her. And, you know, again, it was just that line between having something for a magazine article and having something for a book. You mm-hmm. know, it can be hard to negotiate, and after a few months of spending a lot of research time and contacting family members, et cetera, um, I just realized that it wasn't going to go where it needed to go. So I feel like I've had a lot of false starts, but, um, you know, it's like it's like anything else. You just sort of, you follow it as long as you can follow it, and then at some point, you just have to let go, and you just have to hope that you're not falling into a bad habit, you know? Yeah, yeah. Neil Gaiman has a, a good quote about, um, you know, for advice that he gives to gives to writers, and they ask him, "Well, you know, how do you, yeah, yeah, how do you, how do you go about your work?" He's like, "Well, you know, you do a little every day, and then it adds up." And like, "Okay, well, what do you do if you've been doing that?" He's like, "Well, you have to finish things, and yeah. and then keep yeah. going." So, like, I think you're on that fence there between it, it, are they false starts or is it just possibly yeah. jumping jumping ship too soon um but uh, it sounds like you, you but it sounds like you have the right idea you're looking for the story in there you can't just tell a report it has to have that narrative engine right and like right. if you're not finding it and you can't see it then i think really what you're doing is saving yourself a lot of unnecessary hard work and heartache if the story just isn't there. Yeah, and I feel like I, I haven't, you know, and that's the other thing. I mean, if I were in an MFA program and had to be producing on kind of demand, would these projects have a different angle after a certain amount of time? I don't know. But I haven't, like with, with We As Gotham, I always, I knew what the story was and I knew that there was a beginning and an end after a certain point. And, um, I felt confident in that, and I, I just haven't been able to nail that down. But I, I mean, I still do it because I remain hopeful that it's there, you know. Um, uh, but it is definitely it can it can mess with your mind for sure, mm-hmm. um, and make it easy to procrastinate if you don't force yourself to kind of put words down um, as much as you can. You know, every week at least. You know, just just returning to the page and just kind of believing. Again, as Susanna would say, kind of believing in the process. Right, and and have you? I you say you've considered these as magazine stories versus book. Have you just thought about just straight up doing a magazine piece and see where it, that takes you? Because that that might answer your question right there. You know, I've um, on the proposals that I've written, I've tried. I tried with one of them, and it didn't there were no bites for where I sent it. Mm -hmm. Um, And I felt like I sent it to the only places that I really knew of. Mm -hmm. Um, And then I kind of, I had this little niche going for a while with a couple of the, you know, the 
the online sites for um, for a couple of places, and and then that 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 was that was positive, and I think that you know those aren't magazine pieces per se, but in, in the sense of kind of, and they're not long form, but they're kind of somewhere in that middle ground that you know different kinds of blog entries can take. And I was making a little bit of money from doing those, but you know the issue with doing those is they take a lot of time and they can take you away from kind of the greater focus um, of looking for something else. So I think, you know, I, I think I just do kind of have that personality where I feel like, you know, if I'm doing something and it's just not, it doesn't seem to be working, as opposed to changing the form, I'll just say, well, I'm done with this for right now. I'll go back mm-hmm. to it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but I definitely could have worked harder to and maybe I will. Maybe I think maybe, you know, I think that the the frustration with some of them, you know, with a couple of them anyway is, is kind of abated and I'm, I'll be ready and, you know, in whatever period of time to go back and see if there's anything there. Yeah, there's there's a honeymoon period when you jump onto a good, like a, a story where you think there's something there. And yeah. you, know, you kind of get this head of steam and then you hit a roadblock and then you think, well, there's probably just nothing there in the first place. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I, I yeah, it's kind of an all a, or nothing mentality. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've got a <laughs> half dozen back burner type projects like that. Even some just spec written stuff that I'm hoping to sell just, just like that that just need a little more polishing. And you're just like, I don't know, you're... You, you just get this full head of steam. I'm I'm kind of all or nothing like that too, and I, I have this attention span that's sometimes hard to harness. And but at the same time, yeah, and I, I think with with you with these false starts, I think your your ability to once something hooks you and then you stay with it, you'll know that you have something there. Maybe this is like a def- <laughs> this weird defense mechanism, the subconscious yeah. defense mechanism that's telling you, you listen, <laughs> I'm sparing you some pain here. There's nothing here. Abort. <laughs> I know. It is kind of elementary school playground-ish, sort of like, <laughs> well, you're not working for me, so you're not going to be on my team. <laughs> and you know, the to- like you said, I mean, at some point, um, and I... And I I learned that, you know, after the first one came out and I applied for a couple of college jobs because at the time I thought that's what I really wanted and I have since realized that that I don't I don't know that it is, but you know, having one project out there isn't enough, you know, one longer project and I've had a couple of trusted advisors say to me, You really just need to get a second one out there if this is what you want and I've had that kind of clock ticking in my head and um at the same time, I think, well, am I just going to do it for that reason? Um, there was a local Philadelphia publisher that, that really liked the Benedict Arnold piece, and they were willing to do it. And um, I just kind of thought, you know, if, if there's something wrong with this piece. If, it, you know, I just I don't think it's going to happen. And, and again, you're right. Like It has to be such a gut reaction in the end. Am I going to spend another year and a half? really working on this or Mm -hmm. am I going to say it's not happening I'm done you know for now for now yeah I think following your instincts there is is a is good tact and you can always table it and and, yeah exactly come back to it if you find something new or you you meet somebody new on Facebook who happens to know somebody yeah (laughs) <laughs> who uh, who can point True. you in the right direction and uh, and give you renewed interest in a, in a story like that? But like, I, I want to be respectful of your time here. We've already been on yeah, the yeah, phone yeah. for no, an hour. Um, there's so much stuff that I wanna wanna get to with you. So we're gonna have to have a part two in the yeah. in the not too distant <laughs> future because uh, there's a lot of, there's a lot to dig into that uh, that I'd like like to get to and get your insights on. But this was a uh, Oh, just a wonderful well, thanks, conversation. And, and it's been a, I really appreciate it. I do. Uh, thank you for thinking of me. And um, you know, it always is encouraging, isn't it, to to sort of hash things out a little bit. Well, I think um, so. I think it's a friend. Yeah, it's important to to talk shop. And um, yeah, the this podcast is a. It, it'd be nice if I can do it a little more consistently, but I do it when I can. And it's yeah, it's a it's a. a 
fun excuse for me to call people like yourself and and talk and just talk craft, talk shop, and bounce ideas off each other, and and maybe um, help some other people uh, who might be sure. facing similar hurdles, like seeing uh, working authors who aren't the aren't headliners that are you know headliners at the concert festivals yet, and uh, yeah. and I say yet because <laughs> I, I really feel like. You know, you're on that trajectory right now with the, with the debut book, like uh, We Has Got Him, and then I can always say that I knew you when. Oh, wow. <laughs> well, thank you, Brendan. I, uh, it's been fun and encouraging, definitely. Very nice. Well, definitely. Uh, so let me know when. Let me know when absolutely. you have it, and I'll be thinking of you tomorrow during the, uh, the Belmont. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, uh, thanks again, Carrie, and uh, we'll, be, we'll be talking in the future, I'm sure. Okay, great. All right. All right. Talk to you later. Talk to you later. Bye.